Hi! This is an interview between myself and Corinne Kite-Dean, mostly discussing my brand new debut album, This Is Not Your Grandma's Christmas Record. I recommend that you check it out prior to diving into this interview. Corinne and I are very, very close friends, and we recorded this at 10 o'clock at night. For those reasons, this is an interview in the same way that Finding Nemo is a nature documentary. Enjoy. I'm Corinne. This is Rob. Welcome to Ravi's basement. I'm Corinne. This is Welcome to Ravi's basement. We're talking about Christmas and thanks for having me. <laughs> so, am I interviewing you, or are you interviewing me? Because I prepared interview questions. Okay, also, no. I've got something stuck in my eye already. Oh my god. So we're going I'm gonna start just like weeping. There's a mirror right there, and I can show you to the bathroom if you need it. Oh, alright, I'm gonna use the mirror. Let me just Alright, now I need to go wipe my flipping hands. Oh my god. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host, Ravi Sinar, and I'd like to welcome my guest, Corinne Kiteneen, slithering in from bottom of frame. I am a Slytherin. I've never seen any Harry Potter. Oh, no, I was just saying I'm Slytherin in a southern <laughs> accent. <laughs> Are you we'll pulling get out the notes page? I'm pulling out the notes. I have questions. Wow. Okay. Above um, and beyond the call of duty. Uh, so, my first question is, uh, this is... I'm throwing a, a pitch down center, and it's 80 miles an hour. Got no curve to it. All you got, it's a big old meatball. All you got to do is hit it out of the park. How long have you been working on this album? Uh, five years. I have very fond memories of sitting in the computer lab in the Miriam, now the Miller Theater, mm. uh, in... I think maybe October, and I was working the computer lab job where you just sit there and make sure no one steals a computer and you make mm -hmm. seven, what was it, seven and 25 an hour? Seven twenty-five an hour to start, and then you got like a 50 cent raise, a 50 I believe. Cent raise <laughs> every year, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was doing that, <clears throat> and I vividly remember plunking out the first notes of, do you hear what I hear? And then putting the same, almost the same exact little silly bass line under it on a little silly MIDI keyboard. Which is hilarious, because in hindsight, the only key that I really felt functioning in at the time was C. Hence why that song is in C. Really? And hence why that beginning bass line, when the bass part comes in, is all just, like, the most basic, like, C major pentatonic stuff. That's such a crazy thing to hear, knowing where this ends <laughs> up. Yeah. It's crazy to hear the beginning of this was... I'm going to do it in C because that's the only one I'm comfy in right now. <laughs> yeah, that is exactly... I don't think... Yeah, I don't think there's a version in C. I think... I forget what key it's in originally, but I don't think it's C. So, yeah, it... It, it, it sucked. <laughs> and I, I made it and I said... I remember deleting it because I literally said, this isn't going anywhere. And then I revisited it maybe two or three months later and kept working on it. And then went backwards and did the overture. The cool... With that question in mind, one of my favorite things about this album there are many one of my favorite things is that that song in particular i almost cut it like two months ago like i almost got rid of it it was i remember you talking about cutting it like a year ago though no like, even more re i kept i was so on the edge about it okay because the beginning of it was recorded in what two months the what i just mentioned about mm -hmm. being in a computer lab doing it maybe like november or december like two months later i recorded the beginning of that song and then the end of it was recorded a year ago that's probably when i had that conversation because i recorded the end and it was like wow this is like five years difference the end the end to me is like so full and the harmonies are kind of cool and it's mixed better and i compared that to the beginning and i was like i don't even feel comfortable i knew that there was going to be stuff on the album where it's like this part obviously was very premature, and this part is significantly more mature. I knew that was going to happen, but I didn't think it would be on one song, and I didn't think it would be that drastic, and I hated it for a long time. And still, I'm not totally happy about it. Like, it still makes me feel kind of like, <laughs> but I it is what it is. get why, as the artist, you would feel that way about that dichotomy, but 
as a listener, it's cool. And maybe this is just like my bias coming in because you're my friend and I just know that sure. whatever you pump out is going to be quality. But I feel like it gives it a, a different kind of life and it, like it gives it more room to breathe in like a more creative way. Sure, 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 sure. I have to admit that this is on the list of like, when I had the idea to do like an interview about the album and even specifically to have you come in and do it, um, this was like one of the five things that I wanted to see to it got talked about because if I didn't say what I just said at some point, I would feel even worse because then I feel like people, and there still will be people who listen to it and they go, wow, this like, because the overture, the overture was just made and the overture is like big and heavy and cool because it was made in the last couple months and it was fun and I got to sample the big band that I recorded with and stuff. But then, then the beginning of Do You Hear What I Hear happens and I feel like there will be people who listen to that and go like, wow, this sounds kind of like yikey oopsie. But then by the end it comes back around, but I'm glad I'm saying it now because hello, dear listeners, if you hear the beginning of Do You Hear What I Hear and it sounds kind of whack, I hope you keep listening past that because it it gets better but there will be people who don't know that and i do worry that people will hear that and then go like uh, this is kind of whack Boop. i also hope you know your definition of whack is like <laughs> many people's definition of like masterpiece sure you know? sure, sure sure that's very kind of you uh, i i like i know that uh an audience you're like uh you're going for with this is like somebody who is well-versed and will know what they're listening to and will actively be looking for, you know, things to not necessarily criticize, but like things to like think about in the album. Mm -hmm. And that kind of person might be like, hmm, strange. But that kind of person will also listen for more than two minutes. That's you a good know? point. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And any like Joe Schmo is just going to be like, Wow, yeah. I know this song. <laughs> <laughs> it's mostly mixed stuff. I will confess to that too. It's mostly mixed mm. stuff. Yeah, mixing was the... This album was like an excuse to... Once again, that that like ended up being so cool that this album is literally just me like getting better at mixing, mostly. I'm surprised by how many musical things didn't change. Like some things I feel like I could have written the same thing now. Or I'm sorry... The same things I'm writing now, like, maybe I could have written them a few years ago, but I could not have mixed any of this as, w as well as I did. Not that it's phenomenal, but my mix on a lot of these tracks would be steaming garbage five years ago. This album was, like, just shit is the... Mm -hmm. For the most part, it happens literally in chrono... I think almost everything is in chronological order, save for the overture, because that's mm. the very first thing, and I just made that in the last few months. But there used to be... There was an overture that was so bad, that's the only thing on the album that I did cut and redo. I don't know if you've ever heard the original overture. I don't overture. think I ever heard that. There is an original overture that is cool in concept, but sounds really bad. Like, the mix <laughs> is really, really bad. Is it just the mix, though? Like, the concept is still good? Or is it the same concept, it's just done better now? No, the concept also is kind of rough. It starts with, like, I don't... <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard it. You'll remember when I say this. It, like, starts with the sound of footprints walking through snow. No. No, I don't. Okay, you've never I heard that. Heard <laughs> Which immediately I... Is Have little... you shown it to anybody? I think Shannon maybe heard it. Okay. At the time when it happened. Maybe, maybe eventually I'll let you... <laughs> I'll let you consume that. And, Listen, uh, I, I respect anybody being, like... I'm not showing you like the I'm not parting the kimono <laughs> in that way. It's it's not yeah. good for anybody. The opening the opening was always the same. Uh Happy Holidays. Mm -hmm. That always was there. But that's about it. Okay. That's one of the first things. I have a notes page for this entire album and that had that was one of the first things that went on there. Was I think my wording was grandiose happy holidays. That was just three words at the top of the voice uh not the voice memo, the notes page. Mhm. Mm yeah. yeah 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 okay uh my next question that i had written down was uh what's the best breakfast sandwich dan what McCain, is your perfect i hope sandwich? dan mccain is watching this um <clears throat> actually i shouldn't say that dan mccain had an argument about whether english muffins are good he said they're not and i said they're excellent thoughts uh 
I'd be interested to hear why he thinks they're not good. I think he said they were dry, which immediately told me that he just hasn't had one that's good. Yeah. Which I which was proven correct, because later on he was like, yeah, I made some at home, and I told him to just put an unreasonable amount of butter, which is like, that's kind of the move. And he was That's like, the thing. It's made to, like, have pools of butter in it. Yes. And he was like, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Mm. I think we, I think the argument was that or a croissant. We argued about which was. Oh, well. I'm not a croissant guy. I just, ha- I just, it's just not my vibe. I know a lot of people think they're su- superior. That's like, I mean, to me, that's like you're, you're putting, I don't know, some amateur boxer against Mike Tyson. Are you calling like, a croissant Mike Tyson? I am. You call dude, Mike Tyson a croissant? He's going to beat you. <laughs> dude, he's going to take a bite out of me like I'll take a bite out of that croissant, brother. Uh, he is a funny fella. Dude, I love croissants. Really? I'm like a, a big croissant liker. I'm a big bagel liker. Uh, that was my bottom tier, actually. No, dude, I love a bagel. Have you had like a really good bagel, though? Yeah, I've had some quality bagels. You just don't like... Especially not in the context so of So wait, your, your tier list? What the hell? Your, <laughs> your Is this just bagels and croissants are down here? Yeah. And then what's what's top tier then? Honestly, say bread. It might say be bread. bread bro. You son of a bitch. <laughs> My initial, I the reason I redacted what I was going to say is because English muffins aren't even relevant because my answer was bread. Listen, you got to put some respect on the name bread. But also, what are you talking about? That's my ideal egg back in my youth was um, toast, not bread, toast. Yeah. Um, smoked Gouda. This is whack. I don't do this. Did as... you say back in the day? Yes. Define back in the day. Like when I first started making breakfast foods. So you were like a young teen, perhaps. Yeah, when I was like experimenting with like when, so experiment. Let's call it thirteen. Sure. At thirteen, you were like, I'm gonna get me some smoked <laughs> Gouda. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that did happen. Yes, I would get smoked Gouda, and I would do. I would do one scrambled egg and one fried egg. Coop, coop. Smoked Gouda in the middle. Um, I am a ketchup on egg guy, so it was like ketchup and a drizzle hot sauce. Okay. Yeah. That, that everything name. else, I'm into. That sounds beautiful. But the bread's not doing it for you. Oh, no, I'm even fine with the bread, because oh, like okay. I said, you got to respect. Like, if you can make a an egg sandwich that slams on toast, like, you're golden. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. The smoked Gouda... At, That's throwing you. At an age when I was playing Black Ops <laughs> is crazy, <laughs> you know? All right. Okay. <laughs> I'm going back to the notes app. Okay. Okay. Next question. Corinne. <laughs> My next question is, uh, you had... So, like you had a list of Christmas songs, I'm sure that you wanted to approach, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, how did you decide? You have like a blank Ableton or a blank Logic, whatever, open in front of you. Ableton. How do you decide where where to begin? Ableton, just for the okay. Reference. Ableton. Just need to need to make that clear. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Go on. Yeah. So when you have the blank Ableton open, mm-hmm. you're like, I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna record. Uh, did you know what song you were going to go go to? Did you have like one idea that you'd be like, all right, I'm going to expand on this for a little bit. How would you approach the very beginning of any of one of the arrangements? Usually I would put down a song on that list because I had an idea for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> like I'd be sitting, I have, um, the voice memos are a lot more interesting. I have voice memos that are like, you could do like a nine eight bar and be like simply in a wonderful Christmas time, and that would be the whole voice memo. And then I would add wonderful Christmas time to my list. In fact, I think I literally recorded that voice memo, memo in particular on the toilet at six thirty in the morning, like before a Ron Kerber theory class. Damn, you were pissing at six <laughs> thirty. <laughs> what were you doing at six thirty? Were you asleep? I mean, I don't remember. What I was letting my was. hair freeze, brother. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I wouldn't put down a song until I had an idea for it. And then I would sit down at Ableton knowing that that's where I wanted to go. 
And sometimes it would be the more interesting part was because I had like the chorus recorded, but then it was like, damn, what on earth am I going to do with the verse? Mm-hmm. And with that song in particular, all I could think to do was, doom, doom, and then the verse comes in and it's just me going like, <laughs> you know that thing? <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, I know exactly. What I like. About. I sat down and I was like, all right, I have an idea for the chorus, but like, what's something silly and fun that I can do on the verse? And I had been like wanting to do that for years, that exact thing. So I was like. This is as good a time as any. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's what it ended up being. The only, the only song where I sat down and made something, and then said, "Wait, this would work as a song." Is um, Dominic the Donkey. Mm-hmm. I sat down and I recorded the. That, and I was like, "Dang, that should turn into Dominic the Donkey." In the notes, in my notes memo, in my voice me- no notes memo on the notes page for it i have written a long time ago i wrote dominic the donkey but only as a transition damn it i wanted to bar myself from doing the whole song if i was gonna do it i wanted it to just be the chorus and just like a silly 30 second clip because i thought it was such an outlandish and dumb idea that i didn't want to let myself pursue the whole song dog for real that is my favorite song on the album (laughs) It's so good. That's very, that's very kind of you. It originally... I played it for my mom today. <laughs> <laughs> that's real. That is said. I've only had a few people who approached me and said, I played this for my mom because I liked it that much. So that says a lot, Corinne. And, she, you. and she said, Robbie's just on another level, ain't he? And I said, yeah, he is. That's He's really one kind. of the funniest. Mo- like, your music is as charismatic as you are as a person, which is... That means so much. Which is dope and also really hard to do. That means so much. Because that's not a thing that I get to talk about a lot. That, that like, the charisma thing and the humor thing mm-hmm. is huge and means so much to me. And it's just not something that gets to exist, like, in any other space than that music room right there. Like, I can't quite... Recently, somebody, like... We'll get there in a second. Dominic the Donkey. Um... It originally was just going to be 30 seconds, and the only idea I had was to do the chorus and to do, like, the fattest, like, and that, like, <laughs> that was it. I had a voice memo awesome of me Frank doing... Frank Ryan shit. That, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I had uh, a voice memo of me doing exactly that, and that's the thing where I was, like, only as a transition. Like, you can't do that for two minutes straight. That's fair. But I didn't. I didn't. And it just ended up turning into that other thing. Um, about humor though, that's just not something that gets to happen in any other space. And it's funny because only recently was I clued into the fact that people do notice it. When we did the Big Ben recording for A Marshmallow World, there's like one bar where I wanted Lonel to do a piano fill and I could not get him to do anything other than quote, um, take the A train in that spot. It's on the album, and he did it. And I literally said, it was like the only time, cause like, working in that environment is so much fun because, and I think you know this, because you did um, When I'm Dead. Mm -hmm. And it's just an interesting thing that I think only some artists know what it feels like to have control over every single little bit and thing. That's not the same when you're in a band. When you're in a Mm -hmm. band, you just inherently have to share... You have to share the project that you're working on. You have to share the creative experience. Even if you're... Even if there's a leader, it is a compromise. Yes. Yes. I have learned to not compromise. And I like not compromising. But in the case of a big band, of course, it's like, yeah, of course, everyone's going to play everything differently. I can't really have control. But I said, Lonel, please don't quote take the A train in that part. (laughs) And his response was, nah, man, it's it's Ravi's music. Like, it feels, it just feels right. I have to. And then he wouldn't stop doing it. So I just had to submit. But, um, I, I, like, I didn't, I didn't realize that that is how people perceive me. And I don't take it as a bad thing. Just yesterday, keeping on that same, that same conversation point, just yesterday, we were in a Chronicles rehearsal and we have an intro to one of the songs and it's just big hits. It's big hits in empty space. It goes one, two, three, four. Uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, that's the, it just loops that for a while and it like slowly builds the groove and then the horns come in and stuff. And we did that and I leaned over to Jason and I was like, we're performing this on Halloween, right? And he goes, yeah, this is for the Halloween show. What if we turn that into In the Hall of the Mountain King? Like as an intro to the show. And Jason looked at me and he laughed it off and he said, that would be a very Ravi thing to do. And then that was the end of it. (laughs) Now, mind you, mind you, it was like, it was actually an intro for an intro for Hargrove. So it was Rob's arrangement and it's literally in memoriam. So I knew it was not, I knew it wasn't going to actually like happen. But hearing Jason say that in the way that he did was like, huh. And if it were up to me, that is exactly what would have happened. Like, if it were me sitting in my bedroom, like, doing whatever I do, I would have just been like, I want to do this, and then it would have happened. But mm-hmm. that compromise is just something that that I'm glad to be able to escape when I make this music. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, to be able to just have contr- literally have control over every single note that happens is mm-hmm. a very special thing that I don't take for granted. And I wish more people would do it. Yeah, it's... It's empowering, but it's also kind... It's scary to have that much control. Yes. Because you can kind of get lost in your own sauce sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you wind up... I'm sure you've been in the position of spending an entire day working on one little, like, thread of something. And then the next day you come back and listen to it, and you're like, I was on something then. Like, I was having fun in the moment. That's not good like nobody is having fun with that mm-hmm. i'll admit that doesn't happen for me often i can maybe it do- i don't think it happens for me often either because usually you can you can detect when it's going down that kind of spiral yeah, yeah, and yeah. cut it off at the pass mm-hmm. but i've definitely had it happen yeah i was yeah, like yeah. i i worked really hard on a thing and then realized after the fact i wasted a lot of time i should have just not done something else i should have done something else yeah I'm not saying that time spent wasn't valuable, but yeah, it's like, and if I was in a band, for sure, somebody would have said, Corinne, this no. is not panning out the way you think yeah, it's yeah, going to yeah. pan out. Yeah, I agree. But at the same time, that also goes against, that makes me a bit of a hypocrite because I do always advocate for, for seeing it through, even if it doesn't, even if it doesn't turn into like. I don't know if I've ever made something and then and then not done something with it. Like even the wackiest of things turn into like a silly Instagram video mm. in comparison to just like, all right, this is just gonna like burn and die. That to me, that to me never quite felt right because I think that making it work and making it usable is a very important skill, at least for me and what I do. Like I feel as though I can't afford to get in the habit of making things and then having them go to waste. Like, I always try to reshape it into something later on down the line. There's also a, like, kind of uh, a whiff of schizophrenia in everything you create. And (laughs) that, like, makes it probably pretty easy to, you know, fit it in a place, you know? So, this is the next thing that I was hoping would come up eventually in this conversation (laughs) is, um... I get the Jacob Collier comparison all the time, obviously. I I know. Like, I'm wearing these pants. (laughs) I know. (laughs) It's out there. It's a thing. There are... I do feel as though there is a list of things that make us different, but I think one of the predominant ones is that I don't take this that seriously. Mm -hmm. I do. I take it incredibly seriously, but I leave, like, a large bubble for it to be humorous and stupid and dumb and exaggerated and Dominic the donkey as a rave like that (laughs) inherently that like leaves so much room for it to not feel so contrived the the humor in it to me is so important like I listen to Bill Wirtz's music a lot I Mm -hmm. love Bill Wirtz he's awesome I love Bill Wirtz because it's like it's virtuosic. It is. He is for real, I think, one of the best jazz composers alive right yes. now. People compare him to Jacob Collier, and they say, he's just Jacob Collier, except, like, with, like, musical sensibilities. Which is insane, because at the same time, his music is 
utterly nonsensical, but somehow that makes it more sensible, and it's as if he put more thought into it for that reason. Like, his niche is so different from where Jacob Collier is trying to be. And while I am certainly not Jacob Collier or Bill Wirtz, I just... I feel like there's just a middle ground where you have to have enough... It has to be light enough for me, and there has to be enough humor in it that it's not just some dude, like, making crazy music because he can. Like, this is... Yes, I'm sure, I'm making crazy music, but it's also dumb, and it's funny, and I try not to take it so seriously. I want it to sound like it wasn't taken quite that seriously. Yeah, and but you also want it to be well executed, is, like, yeah. the, the thing you're getting out of it. Yes, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I think comedy, in a lot of cases, is vulnerability, and vulnerability yields great art in most cases. Sure. So if you can be vulnerable enough to recognize the fact that what you're doing is silly, because uh, at the end of the day, it's it's music. We're not flying airplanes or doing brain surgery. Like, yeah. if you can take a second in your music to recognize that implicitly, I feel like it does make the experience more genuine. Mm. Because it's showing the audience, like, you have... You have enough self-awareness to be like, this is music, guys. <laughs> like, it's it's cool. We're having fun here. Yeah. You know? That's why I'm glad that this is a Christmas album instead of a serious, like, debut original thing. Mm -hmm. Aside from the fact that I didn't feel good about writing original lyrics yet, and that's why I made so many covers, um, it also was just because, like, yeah, I have all these silly ideas, and I feel like they will go over better if I just disguise it as silly Christmas music. Like, that just, to me, aided in making it that much more humorous and not quite taking itself so seriously. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think you accomplished exactly the thing you set out to. I do feel this. like I do, and that's why I'm releasing it. That's that, when I felt that happening, that is when I decided that this is something I needed to release. And I think it wasn't until Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. <laughs> That I was like... Another slammer, by the way. Uh, thank you. That's when I was That's like... That's probably my number two, is Grandma. Thank you. Thank you. That's when I was like, this is doing what I needed to do. Like, this is so absurd, but it also, like, feels right, and it feels fun, and it's musically interesting and competent, but it's also Grandma Got Run Over by Reindeer with 200 voices. Yeah. <laughs> and at least that's clear, you know? That's, that's what I wanted it to be, and it's, uh, it happens. And you did it. Yay. Are you glad that you're done and releasing it and are you now like okay let's get on to the next thing i don't know i haven't i haven't gotten there yet because this is being recorded what is today october october 27th 2023 okay yeah today the album will not release for another two weeks hence why i'm not like i'm still in the thick of it so i don't know the day it releases there will still be promo to do when it's all said and done, this was like a nice pocket of my life. Like the last few months of finishing this and putting it together. Um, especially because in all seriousness, the last, the latter half of the album was recorded in, I'll let you do that. <laughs> um, the latter half of the album was recorded since the beginning of this year. The lat, yeah. So yeah. it's been like, it's been a thrash as people in the car community say it's been thrashed together um i actually i have a car question too i don't look forward to <laughs> okay um, um so this has been i i've said you've probably heard me say this before many people have heard me say this i like to live my life in chapters it's like this is happening and then when this next big thing happens that will be like the beginning of another chapter. in chronicles if you will hello jason Check out Atomic Fizz's new album. <laughs> That's messed up. <laughs> but actually, do I was but actually say, I don't. Yeah, that just, it's no shade to Chronicles. I, Atomic Fizz's album. No, I was came gonna out today. I was gonna mention it that. Yeah, that was today. It is excellent. I already listened to the whole thing, which is rare air for me because I don't listen to music much. But I checked it out immediately, and it rocks. Yeah, it slams. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Good for them. Um, because I thrashed the latter half of the album in the last six months, this is like the closing of a chapter when this is said and done. And I don't know what's next because I've just been playing wedding band gigs. I have exactly one private lesson student. I'm just like skirting on by. So I don't know. I think next next will literally just be... Next is going to be finding a steady job, actually. 
and then like, that's like we'll see what happens creatively. that's like the next goal yeah probably okay. and then we'll see we'll see what i have room for creatively after that but obviously yes the next step not that you asked but i wouldn't even <clears throat> like not to say that approach is like wrong in any way but like i wouldn't approach it like we'll see what i have room for creatively like don't worry about it <laughs> you're gonna it's going to flow out of you i don't know I this do. took five years because I know school this was took... hard to squeeze that in around. I know, but it's going to come out of you because I know you pretty well. I would be so bold as to say. Sure. And I know yeah, that you would uh, lament a wasted opportunity to engage in something that you knew was going to be valuable to somebody. Right? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Somebody including yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. You nail on that. Yes. And in this case, I do think not that I have any assumptions about how this album's gonna do. I have not gonna do. Which Might is not good. do anything, and that's fine. That's great. Um As long as there are as long as I can actively think of three people who I know this album is gonna mean a lot to, I think I and I can. I think I owe it to those three people to then make like actual like meaningful like genuine music in comparison to Dominic the Donkey that is that is a genuine thought that I have had I don't know if I could make like a Halloween album after this <laughs> you know, like I, I think I, I need to do you know what it's like I, I don't know if I said this to you I might have said this to Shannon um the last five years were ages 17 to 22 a lot happens emotionally between the age of 17 and 22 mm -hmm. i like fell in love for the first time like etc all of the crazy like life-altering things that happen in that age frame do you know what it was like to feel those feelings and to make dominic the donkey <laughs> and to get that flow into Dominic the Donkey. Instead of being like, all right, I'm going to write a sad song because I just had my first... Instead of writing Going to Georgia, <laughs> you, you wrote that version of Dominic the Donkey. Yes, which was strenuous in hindsight. Not actually. Not actually. It wasn't strenuous at all. I should not say that. It was like a very unique kind of relaxation and an escape from the world that I needed. But also, I do have five years of like life that I feel like probably deserve to be written into, into music. I have a mm -hmm. lyric book that is chock full and stuff that I do feel good about that I think I will be tearing into next. Eventually. I think that's a great place to go. And I also want to circle back on you saying you want to start making meaningful music. I would not at all say that Not Your Grandma's Christmas album is not meaningful. Thank you. Even yes. though, like you said, there's comedy in it. Like, I don't think the comedy takes away any like sure. meaningfulness from sure, it sure, at sure, all sure. that's a that's a hard line to walk in talking about it because i have to i have to um it's like yeah it's silly and it's humorous but yes i do also want it to have meaning and it i mean it inherently does uh i don't think you've read the liner notes if you buy a uh, if you buy a physical copy you can read the liner notes <laughs> the liner notes the liner notes took a very long time to get the the verbiage verbiage Verbiage. Verbi the word choice is what you're going for? Yes. Verbiage, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Corinne. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> I'm almost an English major. The only major that makes less money than oh, a music major. Oh, man. Computer lab <laughs> monitor. Computer lab. <laughs> um, the verbiage in the liner notes felt right. And it's a very, it's a very detailed explanation of what this album does mean despite it being silly and being humorous there is like it turned it started as just being silly and humorous i'm going to make wacky christmas music and then it became so much more than that over the course of the next 5 years by the copy the uh, five no I'm, I'm sure it's stuff we've probably already talked about but it is written very concisely in the line i would like to check it out sure sure um do you want to get to the car question? I could ask you the car question because we can... we spent a long time talking about music, so now we can talk about cars. Maybe? I open this bat again. Yes. Go <laughs> <laughs> on. Okay, so I don't know what Ravi's intended audience is here, but perhaps this reaches outside his you know personal circle. 
If it does, then you may not know our good friend Ravi. Well, my good friend. I just got finished saying that you're not no, his no, no. good friend. We're, we're friends too. We're, it's okay. He's playing the parasocial card. Don't fall for his little <laughs> trap. Uh, trap. So trap. you may not know our boy Ravi is a bit of a car guy. He's a car guy. Ravi is. He's got a couple of nice cars. I've never driven a manual. He's never driven a manual, but he <laughs> does have a car that has the Prince logo on it. Yes. Thank you for not mentioning the and one that's crashed and burned. <laughs> I was, well, I was about to say it, but then I couldn't remember if it was a 67. Is oh, it? 68. 68. 68. 68. Uh, so, okay. Car question. Sure. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> At its inception, why a Christmas album specifically? I know we've already talked about like how you started choosing the songs, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But why did you funnel that into Christmas music? Were you like is Christmas music like a, a foundational part of your musicality, would you say? No, not at all. Okay. So no, how, was, how did way you more way more contrived? How did you wind up there? By accident. No, it was very unintentional. And I've never thought about that. It was very unintentional. It just happened to be the time of year. Maybe I think I was being over enthusiastic and I thought that it was gonna come out in a month. <laughs> Is that true? I thought not the album, but I thought I was going to make something and release it in a month's time. Because that this was all like the winter time frame. Because mm. once again, I remember recording the beginning of um, Do You Hear What I Hear in like November. And I was like, yeah, I'll finish this in a month, release it for Christmas. And then I think A Marshmallow World came like a year later when I wrote that little silly big band recording. I don't know if you've heard the old recorded, recorded version because there is one. I may have. There's an old recorded version that I did in like sophomore year. Because I remember hearing a couple of old versions of stuff of stuff yeah. yeah a marshmallow world had like an actual recorded version i mm -hmm. went to uarts with this same microphone and asked scott blanky to read all four parts and asked spencer sivko to read all four parts and i asked sarah rose hinson to record <sighs> background vocals and it yeah it like turned in and it's mixed terribly it's mixed so bad <laughs> i hope yeah once and once again it's like so I don't know why that happened. I don't know why it was a Christmas song and then another Christmas song. I also don't know when I decided it would turn into an album, an entire album. That was I think. my next question. I think I called it an EP for a while because I could only think of four songs to mm -hmm. do. Like I only had four ideas for four Christmas songs. And then I think as I came up with more and more ideas that I felt were good enough to put time into, then once the number climbed up to like seven or eight and nine, it was like, okay, I might as well just just put it out just keep pushing make it into something okay so it was yeah i mean i i guess i wouldn't call that contrived but like it was it was kind of out of the blue that it just like fell into your lap yes yeah absolutely i could not tell you why i plunked out the first few notes of do you hear what i hear i have no idea hmm. I, it might have just been stuck in my head that day that's kind of like spiritual in its own way yeah yeah it just happened it did just happen Somebody might have an answer for that that I don't know. Uh, like, I might have talked to Shannon or Jamie, like, about it when I first was thinking about it, and they seriously might be able to be like, yeah, you said it was because of this. I'm sure there was maybe a reason, but I don't remember it. That's it was sick. five years ago now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Half a decade. It's a long time. It. I have only thought about it on a few occasions, but yeah, that is a long time between the inception of this and to have it happening now. It's like a fourth of your life has... One fourth of my life? Oh, 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 oh. You mean my life up to this point? Yeah. I thought you meant my whole life. Oh, no, no. No, I'm dead at 20. <laughs> Robbie Cinerine found dead November 12th, 2023. Uh, <clears throat> no, yeah, I'm saying, like, up until this point, you've spent a quarter of your life dedicated to, like, this creative effort, right? Yeah. Arguably between a, my, between a fourth and a fifth. Yeah. It was like my, my, it was my creative outlet for the last five years. Mm -hmm. There were maybe like very few little small things that also happened in the same. Sorry. <laughs> I know you're going to hear that. Um, 
there were just a few small things that happened in the same in the last five years of course duh um like i wrote a chronicles chart maybe i think i arranged something for sax quartet once but other than that there has not been much other than this whenever i got bored and just wanted something it was well there hasn't been much other than this in terms of like putting like waveforms to doll right but like yeah i mean that's not the extent of your musical creativity in the last five years Yes, there were many a saxophone lick (laughs) (laughs) there were there were many a many things yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yes correct whenever it was like i want to sit down and get better at mixing or i want to record something or make something wacky all the wacky energy and all of the recording energy went into this Mm -hmm. yeah what is so does this album exist solely as an album are you going to make arrangements for things do you have any plans on like expanding on what this album is or not really i would like to perform it live somehow although it would be a monster like yeah dude it would be really hard i'd have to i would have to use tracks i think i think unless i got enough musicians on stage but in my mind i would get four good friends rock and musicians you are on the list for consideration, but it's like, but it's for like consideration. Because <laughs> oh. I'm not sure. Because there's no guitar. Because there's barely any guitar on the no, whole. No, you honestly, guitar. My guitar would sound, I think, out of place in this. No, that's well. That's why you specifically are on the list because your guitar is the only one that I would maybe want to figure out how to fit in. That's interesting. For all the textures that exist on this album, I would gladly welcome every texture that you bring to the table. Hmm. I would just have to think about whether or not it would... Like, on in each individual song, I would have to question what I would want you to do and whether it would be worth your time. So, you said you would get four friends? You, like, you envision this as, like, a quintet with tracks or a quintet without tracks? With tracks. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I was like, that would be nuts if no you tried tracks? to, like, do justice to this album yeah. with, like, just three a quintet. People, three or four people, yeah. <laughs> that would be I, nuts. It would have to... Seri- if I ever wanted to do it without tracks, it would genuinely have to be, like, all big band arrangements. Mm-hmm. That would be really fun, and I would enjoy that, but that's not... I don't think that's feasible or practical. I think it would be... Going back to what you said earlier about how you had full control over this, mm-hmm. I think... If I put myself in that position, it would be hard for me to relinquish that control and give it to give things that I did have control over to a band where now I don't have control. And you may have a like a different outlook on that. But for me, I feel like I would be like, "Mm." no, I absolutely agree. Could you play it like I played it on the record, which I agree. And then you'd have like August Schultz, who actually plays drums. And he'd be like, yeah, but the goofy plate is stupid. Yeah, it's stupid. Sorry. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Um, That's why, that's maybe why I would want to use tracks. Mm -hmm. That is the genuine thought I had, was that things that I feel like would need to stay the way that they were on the record would be on the track. And then everything else that I absolutely trust August and Zach or Lonel or Dan McCain to play. Like, absolutely. Give them the thing. Do you know how dumb you have to be to put Zach guys on stage and then play your pre-recorded bass track on top of him instead of him playing? (laughs) Why would you? So that's like a that's genuine like an ego problem, I think. Probably. Yes, but it's it's like a real. I mean, it's it's real though. It's like I do want it to stay original to the record, and I want it to be the record because it took five years, and I've put this, such a specific kind of energy into it. But at the same time, yes, Dan McCain would crush crush anything that I asked him to play, without a doubt. But would he play it like that? And how important is it to me that it sounds like that? So it's gen. It's that's why I'm not saying for certain whether I'm going to try to make a live performance out of it because I am actually still questioning how I would do it and what I would need to consider in order for it to happen. What do you think scratches your musical itch more? Doing recorded stuff or playing things live? Playing things you like live, I'll say. Because, you know, a, a wedding band is not the same thing as playing originals live. Or okay. even playing in a band, even if it's not your yeah. originals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, recording things is my bread and butter. Really? There is not a joy. There seriously, there is nothing in this world that br- family. Sure, there's nothing in this world that brings me joy the way that that does. Hmm. That's really cool, 
be to hear you say that because I feel like a lot of times I'll hear people say I prefer recording and like the reason they probably prefer recording is because they can't quite nail it live and with you I know that's not the case you can nail it live like you're a very good live musician thank you uh and I've it's I kind of feel this way about uh like guitar specifically tone guys like guys who are like I like getting like I like saying like oh I care a lot about like my tone and how my guitar sounds and like I have like you know really good gear that like does exactly what I wanted to do those guys always can't play for shit like none of them because they're like I feel like it's easy to delve into like gear and be sure, like sure, sure, sure. I'm going into this analog chorus and then I have this <laughs> I have a caverns delay slash reverb and then I have the walrus yeah, reverb yeah, yeah, yeah. you know it's easy to do that uh, as a replacement for learning how to play your instrument better mm -hmm. and I feel like a lot of times when I like when somebody is like you know I'm not talking about like real session players of yeah, course right. they're all mm -hmm. monsters too mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but any like in school I feel like I would you know lots of people who are like in the embed like wave of things it was like they were really good at doing their embed thing they it was just another world to do live performance and that wasn't their thing yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and i feel like you kind of have both and most people who can do live are like oh, i prefer i prefer the energy of like playing live music so it's kind of cool to be to have the opposite have the opposite opinion yeah yeah um i appreciate that a lot but i wholly disagree with it because every time i get the jacob collier comparison i further deny it because he has both he can actually go in there do the shit and then do the same shit live. I cannot do the same stuff live. I'm not that kind of... Saxophone, maybe, with the exception of saxophone, yes, I could take a pretty solid saxophone solo in there and then do it live and probably have it sound pretty similar. Could not do the same thing on bass. Part of my favorite thing about that is that it can be just... I can do 260 takes of the same four bars on bass because it's really fast and really hard, and only then will I get it right. And then once I get it right... I will put it down and maybe be a little better at doing it next time. But it would still be another three years before I could play it live. Like, it's just, I, and I accept that at a certain point, it has to just be like, like you have time. It's, it's the, it is literally the conversation about composer versus improviser. Mm -hmm. Improvising is just composing, but faster. That is composing in the way that I have all the time in the world to practice however much I want to do as many takes as I want. Live performance isn't that. And while I still do enjoy live performance, especially on saxophone, um, at a certain point, I've just acknowledged, I've said it before to people that saxophone is the only instrument that I'm a professional at. Like I have put in the time and the effort into being well-versed and being able to talk about technique and this, that, and the other foundational skills. I can't say that about any other instrument that I play. And I think that in a live setting, I feel like there would be more times than not where that is made apparent, which is why I don't like doing it as much. How would you pref define professional then? I think, like, you know, I feel like dictionary.com disagrees that you're not a professional, you know, bassist, a professional piano player, a dictionary professional singer. I think you're intentionally comparing the definition of professional on dictionary.com to the way that you and I think of the word professional. A musician's concept of professional is different from what dictionary.com would say about it dictionary.com yeah sure i'm a professional but dictionary.com is not a musician yeah musicians are musicians and musicians have a definition that i don't think i fit into okay like i i for sure see the point you're making i my heart is telling me i disagree i feel like i i would call you a professional all those things 
I appreciate that. That's not to that. say it's not a, like a nuanced Yeah, of course. Thing. Of course. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wouldn't sit next to Lonel Johnson and try to play piano or sit next to Zach guys and try to play bass. And yes, I'm naming like monsters of these instruments, but there is also like freshman piano majors who I also know not to sit down next to because they could talk circles about technique or improvising, just things that I don't know about and have never put the time into. Does that mean they could make This Is Not Your Grandma's Christmas record and play the same piano solo that I did? No, maybe not. But that doesn't negate the fact that I, it is just two different skills. It mm-hmm. is two wholly different things. Yeah. That's a very complicated conversation. I've had this conversation, like, I've, I have thought about this a lot, and I still don't quite know. I feel like I have this conversation with my with the mirror, <laughs> like, <laughs> every six months or yeah, something. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's imposter syndrome. Do you have, like, bad imposter syndrome? No. If I do, it's mild. I think if I really did, none of this would happen. I think I... I think I agree. I think think it was Ron Kerber. I think I once said to Ron Kerber, because he heard something that I had made, like, in exactly the style. It was very, very Ravi, whatever it was. And Ron said... uh, I said... I feel as though um, when I first started playing music, I had a huge head on my shoulders very quick. I had very re- reasonably supportive parents, and I had a band director who, I wouldn't say blow, blew smoke, like he knew what he was doing. He just knew all the right ways to support me and to make sure that I would want to further practice. Speed. You saw me miss my mouth? <laughs> no, I just saw you eat it really fast. Did you miss? I missed my mouth. Rewind, replay. Um, rewind. Welcome back. <laughs> yeah, the reason we're uh, pre-recording this like this is so that when one of us says something stupid, we can zoom past it. <laughs> because I had such a big head on my shoulders, and I had such an ego, I felt that much more empowered to be able to do silly, silly shit like this. And it's been weird, like, taming it and seeing what it turns into. Ron Kerber, of course, responded with something very wise and sage. I forget what it was. He said, that's not ego. That's something else. I forget what he said. I wish I remembered. Um, But in my mind, it still started off kind of as ego. It was just me believing I, like, had the right to be able to do all of these things in a a way that at the time was kind of half-assed. And I maybe wasn't ready to do it. And I was maybe making a mockery of myself and of of the art form and of bass players. That's, I mean... Every 18-year-old artist feels sure. that way. Sure, 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 sure. Which which is why, over the last five years, once again, over the course of making this album, I've been able to have frequent and very, like, like literally in the process of making something, I could stop and be like, am I making this because of an ego that I have? Why am I focusing on this in the way that I am? And it's... It, This album was a vehicle for me to continue learning about that and to keep honing it and questioning it and figuring out what I actually want it to be like for me. What I actually want, the balance of, like, ego versus just passion and optimism. Figuring out which one is which. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. Yeah. Once upon a time, it was just ego. I will admit to that gladly. I was a... I think that's rough person in high school. That's kind of how it has to start for a lot of people. Not for everybody, but for I think a lot of people who decide they want to go into music as a career, they want mm. to study it professionally, like it there has to kind of be some sort of expectation that you're better than most people at this thing. Um, whether that's whether that's an ego thing or it's just, uh, you know, s- something people are telling you or mm-hmm. whatever. There has to be a part of you that recognizes, like, it makes no sense for me to do this, like, societally. Everything is screaming at me to, to do something else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I think I'm different. Yeah. You know, like because every single musician hears it from the moment they dare to utter the words they want to study music. Yeah. You know, they hear. Why would you do that? Yeah. Like there's go on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. 
but it, like you do it anyway because you're like no nah, i'm different yeah or uh alternatively not necessarily i'm different but no i approach this differently than you think i do mm -hmm. my high school band director i forget when but the day i decided i wanted to be a musician was the day when he said hey you are good at this and if you wanted to you can make a career out of it and i was like will we <laughs> and then from that moment i went from wanting to be a lepidopterist and catch butterflies all day to wanting to play the saxophone professionally hmm. all it took was that little boost of ego perhaps if you want to call it that um and that's when I was like, okay. Well, the ego's in you. I won't say... That it's instilled by other people. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. But it didn't help. Yeah, <laughs> whatever, sure. Whatever sure. ego I had, yeah. he, he added fuel to the flame. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Another very, very... I won't even say egotistical. It's just the the fact of the matter. And it is my experience that one of the reasons why I like doing this so much in comparison to playing saxophone is that there's just the competition factor is gone. It is nearly gone. Like are there other people making music like this? Yes, but not not quite the same way. It's just like factually so much more spaced out in comparison. Like what's how many miles away do you think the next person is who is making this? I, for real? I wouldn't even know, like, what you mean by this. Even better. Follow-up question. How many miles away do you think is the cat who can play saxophone at the same level that I can? Two. Yeah! <laughs> Chris Farr lives down the street, like, <laughs> okay. literally, literally two miles away is Chris Farr, mm -hmm. and I think, I don't think I can think of anyone closer, and that's not a dig, I just don't, I don't, I think I'm the only person around here who but who, for saxophone. But who around here can play yes. the saxophone as, as Ravi, as well as Ravi, I think I could say the same sure, thing. Sure, yes. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. You had, you... You know, as much as you may like to, uh, you're not putting yourself down because no, you, no, because I'm you not. know, you're good at the saxophone. I, I know a saxophone, yeah. but yeah, yeah, yeah. even still, as much as you like to say, like, you know, there are other people who can absolutely blow me out of the water. Um, all of them, they still play saxophone like them and you still play saxophone like yes. you. Yeah. And you are going back to like, I can hear your charisma in your music. I hear your charisma in your saxophone playing too. I can mm. tell when it's you playing the saxophone. You have an identity on the instrument mm. the same way anybody does. Yeah. So I, w I wouldn't even say like, like I get the comparison you're making like for real it's very more it's it's much more spaced out yeah the stuff from there yes yeah, yeah um yeah. there is for real nobody doing that thing that you're doing exactly you know mm -hmm. anywhere yeah but I would also say the same thing about you in a practice room sure 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 yeah that's not to negate that that I still have a, that I have a unique sound on the saxophone and that but one of the reasons why I got so deep into this, I will admit, is because it was like, it felt safer. It, there was less risk of having to compete. There there was less risk of having to compete with anyone else in the way. And that's not to say that music has to be in competition or you have to win, but it was just like, I want to feel like I am presenting something, presenting, presenting something that is unique and will mean something to someone. And while I'm happy to do that on the saxophone, it felt like there will be more opportunities for me to do that by doing this than playing the saxophone. Do you think that has anything to do with the fact that that can be finished and Whoa. playing a solo is like, you're never going to play a solo that can't be improved upon, right? 
Yes. But that you can like put in a folder and say, this is done. <laughs> I did that. Draft two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Control. It's all about control, Corinne. It do kind of be all about control. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when like, even if I had 40 musicians and I tried to do a cover of one of these songs and wrote out all of the parts, it still would not, I would not have enough control, which like sent once again, that sounds ludicrous, but there's just something to it. There's just something. And it's why I think it's so, it's why, one of the reasons why I think this album has value, and it's why I think more, I I wish more people would create in this manner, because, like, it couldn't possibly be more me. Mm -hmm. Every single note choice, every single inflection, all the intonation, all the voicings, all the everything, like, it's so pure, which is why I messaged you when you were, um when you released when I'm dead because it was just so like, I know Dan McCain has a project right now where he's doing a lot, almost all of the recording and the instrument playing. And I just think that's such a special thing to hear, to know that someone is putting that much time and attention into it's one thing to play saxophone and be like, all right, I want this to sound this way, which means I have to play this fingering and then this fingering and I have to play this note with this inflection it is a totally different thing to say I want this song to sound like this and then to have to say all right so in that case I need this bass tone to sound like this and I need it to be mixed like this and I need to do this with this and then I need the drums to do this I need this hand percussion I need this guitar lick like it it just open it's it's not negating the fact that it is special when someone sounds like themselves on saxophone but it is just a totally different thing that I that I just happen to enjoy more doing it and hearing it to just know that someone put not an no I guess it is just an exponential exponentially more time into crafting like this thing we've talked about like um how I think about recording vertically rather than horizontally like I'll do a verse and then think like a verse I'll just like sing the verse and then I record this way for like mm-hmm. two hours straight and I go from one track to 30 that like I don't know it's just different is it any more special than when I was singing that first line and thinking about every decision that I would make I don't know but it feels that way it feels like it's different to have 20 tracks of my decisions in comparison to just one and in a way that does make all the difference in the world if it feels like a different thing then it is a different thing yeah right yeah, 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 like yeah. that's kind yeah. of you're manifesting that in your in your decision making process before you've laid a single thing out mm-hmm, mm-hmm. sure yeah yeah which is why i wish it were i which is why i wish it were more common every time i hear it i really do try to like reach out to you or to noah noah Uy, when yeah he released this thing i reached out to him and i said yo this sounds like this is like all you i have so much <sighs> I have so much appreciation for... Study Hall, check it out. Study Hall, Study Hall, no we great. Um, I have so much respect for when someone hears something in their head and then puts all of the time and effort into making it sound exactly the way that it sounds in their head. I think you can hear it. I almost always think you can tell that someone has put that much effort into making it sound exactly the way they want, which is what this, like, is is a bunch of very silly, silly, whether they're silly or not, a bunch of ideas that were kind of crazy. Are you okay? Yeah. You're just, you're saying things that are so beautiful and (laughs) I, I really can't handle it. I thought I was going to be able to keep it together. Oh, oh, do you want a paper towel slash a light dimmer? Um, my, (laughs) I had a saxophone teacher once say to me, I'm about to describe to you my worst nightmare that came true. And I think it it is like the the big bang that leads to my thoughts on the subject now. Uh, I was a freshman in high school doing the pre-college program at UArts. And I had an instructor who was a phenomenal saxophone player. Um, 
he was running the group that I was in. And he asked me to play bass clarinet on a song. It was a song called Prelude to a Kiss, which is a little difficult, all things considered. It's a tough tune. Yeah. Ravi, in freshman year, didn't know what a blues was. So asking him to play Prelude to a Kiss was kind of whack. Mm-hmm. We had a vocalist, so she was singing the melody, but he asked me to outline a bass line. And I was like, I literally said, dude, like, I'm not, I don't know what a blues is. I don't know what any of this means. Please don't ask me to do that. His response was, are you really going to be one of those people who only does things when you know that you're going to be good at it? Whoa. Whoa. The concert was like a week later. I shit the bed so hard. I sounded fucking awful. I sounded terrible. And to this day, I still don't know what that did in my brain. Like, because I remember looking at him, and I think he literally went, like... (laughs) Oh. And I don't... I think it did the wrong thing. Because I just worry about that more now. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to be in that position. I don't like that position. I think he wanted to... He I'm wanted you to get comfortable in the uncomfortability. Yes, I am appreciative because it did do that. From then on out, I was that much more comfortable in those kinds of situations. But that's still a pretty shiny turd. Mm-hmm. Like, regarding how comfortable I am doing that, it's not very comfortable. I still avoid it at all costs. I don't like it. Yeah. Do you think that has something to do with the, like the ego that we were talking about before like do you think you're opening yourself up to like if you're in an unfamiliar situation you're opening yourself up to getting your like ego a little crushed yeah and like that one that of the was... reasons one of the reasons i was not a jam session guy mm-hmm. didn't even want it and like i feel like and the one time i did oh <laughs> i think the first jam session i ever went to first jam session i ever went to was at time and I didn't even have my saxophone. And the person running the jam session was like, you sing too, right? Get up here, sing a tune. <sighs> okay. I go up, I sang Sunny Side of the Street, the UART special. And I remember I almost skipped the bass solo. I almost came in back, I almost came back in with the head and I forgot to check with the bass player if he wanted to solo. The kind of dread that I felt in that moment to be in that unfamiliar of a circumstance surrounded by that collection of people where you didn't eat you didn't even mess up to be clear Mm -hmm. you you didn't skip the bass solo i almost skipped the bass solo you almost messed up and that (laughs) fucked you up so bad my heart that you were you were like i'm not going to a jam session again that is like baseline maybe the worst I've ever felt on stage. Like, not, I'm not saying that situation was the worst, but as far as that ties with any of the worst feelings I've ever had on a stage. Wow, dude. Yeah. Yeah, it's dark. <laughs> it's dark. And I wouldn't say that I'm proud of it, once again, because I've had people who say, like, no, dude, like, mistakes are just gonna happen. Mm-hmm. I don't like that. <laughs> I'm not built different, but I, I do wish I was. I wish my experiences led led to not that, but life's going to happen. It is what it is. And once again, obvious, I've been tempered to it in many a circumstance, but it doesn't negate the fact that I really don't like it. And who does? You know? Yes. Yeah. Why are we going to do a therapy session? Because <laughs> we're friends. That is correct. And we've been talking for two hours, and that's what happens that when friends is, talk for two that hours. That is correct. The first, the first hour and a half was... was functioning <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, uh, yeah you're i probably went off on weird rants you're probably gonna have to cut down in which case we both we both had our moments that's <laughs> <laughs> why that's why i that's why i wanted you for this Corinne. it's all right good how do we sign off ladies and gentlemen you might notice that there are less fries than there were <laughs> A mere moment ago. That's because Corinne and I have been off on a tangent for the last hour or so. Uh, most of which has no reason to be inside of this clip, so. You got anything else, Corinne? Look. I. 
If that's all you got, then I don't want it anyway. <laughs> uh, no, this was fun. Thanks for having me along. Yeah, absolutely. I was happy to talk to you about music for a little while. Thank you for having me. In my thanks own house. for, thanks for having me. Yeah, wait. You said thanks for. See, that is kind of weird about this because you would say thanks for having me because you were invited. But I was invited, just... but I was the one also. Asking yeah, questions. you were the one doing it. Was, it was. It's a weird like interviewer wanted interviews inside. Type we thing. are a snake eating our own tail. Mm-hmm. Now, why do you think I should think I should have this job? I think that you should have this job because I think that you think that I think that I need to think that you. Where think do you that see I me seeing to... myself in five years? <laughs> I hope you don't hate me and I hope you love him. I hope you're indifferent about me and you love him. I hope you hate both of us. And I hope you, you know what? I hope you hate both of us. (laughs) And I hope you buy this album. Uh, Oh, wait. Yeah, maybe I should do a plug. I mean, they know what we're talking about. If they're watching it now and they're still like, well, what's this all about? (laughs) I intend to post this a couple days after the release of the album. So if you haven't listened to it yet, and you watch this interview, first off, that's very, very silly. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> that is insane. Um, but it, if not, so, yeah, I guess I can't say if not, because ideally you've, wa- you've seen it by now. But if not, for some strange reason, maybe you're confused. Stop being confused. This is not your grandma's Christmas record available on at least two platforms because there's too many covers and they didn't want to put it on all of them. <laughs> Uh, buy a t-shirt. By now, I think I will have figured out how to print those. Um, I just don't know if I'm going to print them myself or if I'm going to actually have them printed by oh, a company. Got them. Um, I don't know if you can see it. I'm going to make sure you can. Yeah, what do you do? Buy a t-shirt. Let me look at it. I'm also going to print mouse pads. Hopefully. Do I don't know because it's in the past. Do you think they can hear you? Yeah, they can hear me pretty well. Oh, okay. If not, I'll switch to phone audio. Um, mm. yeah. Buy a t-shirt, buy a mouse pad, buy a CD. If you want it shipped to you, let me know. Um, yeah, what the digga darn do? I imagine I will see you in the near future. Corinne will also see you in the near future. I'm around. I'm round, period. That's a good way out.